All right, it looks like we have a decent amount of folks on now. I think we can get started. Um, Brian, we'll kick it off to you. Oh, there we go. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Poitras with GFI Partners uh, here in Boston. We're uh, owner, operator, and developer of commercial real estate. And as many of you know, we recently acquired the Southwood Hospital site. And um, we're holding this meeting tonight uh, to give you an overview of our public involvement plan with respect to uh, remediation and cleanup of uh, environmental conditions at the site. Um, I want to give you an overview of the process. Uh, we have on the call here uh, Robert Berg with EnviroTrack, who is our engineer, licensed site professional, who is helping us with this process. Um, tonight you'll hear you know, an overview of timelines and how you can be involved in the process. Uh, we welcome your comments. And we're looking forward to working with our neighbors here to develop this site in a way that works for everyone. So um, with that, I would like to turn it over to Bob to give you um, an overview of the public involvement plan and uh, give an opportunity to ask questions. Thank you. Good evening. Um, glad to see a good turnout. This is, uh, this is awesome. It's, it's always uh, encouraging when so many people are interested in a, in a process like this. Um, as many of you probably know, we're at the beginning of a, of a long process on this associated with the development and um, concurrent remediation of the property. Um, you know, GFI it took uh, it through their, their subsidiary 111 uh, Dedham Street LLC, uh, took ownership of the property about three months ago. And they've already been uh, heavily engaged with uh, community uh, organizations, planning board, zoning board, others um, you know, to discuss opportunities for development and what that might look like that meets the needs of, uh, of the community and, and the marketplace. Um, tonight, we're gonna talk uh, about the public involvement plan. Um, we have a draft public involvement plan and slides which have been uploaded to the uh, EDEP uh, web portal and are available now for download. Um, and uh, so we'll go through that. Um, just a brief overview of what this meeting is for, what we're, we're trying to accomplish here. Um, we're going to summarize site conditions in a, in a very uh, broad, uh, high-level view. It's a complicated site. It's been developed for 100 years. Um, there's been a lot of investigation done um, over the last 30 years or so. Um, and so we're going to keep it at a high level uh, for the purposes of this meeting. And as we move into other meetings and, uh, and take on MCP uh, compliance issues and uh, more of the MCP process, we will obviously uh, go into much greater detail, technical detail uh, as we present um, you know, those different uh, actions that we're proposing. Um, we're also going to uh, talk about the draft plan, what it contains, and, and really primarily um, you know, solicit questions and comments. Um, you know, this plan is, is pretty, uh, is pretty um, dictated by um, you know, Mass DEP in terms of um, what the plan contains. So it's not a, a large body of creative writing. Um, it lays out basic stuff, which I think they all do. And, um, and you know, so what we want to hear is comments on, on how you might want to tweak it um, to better meet your needs um, in terms of communication. Um, already had some comments and uh, I encourage everyone who has a comment about how we tweak it or what we might change to, um, to provide written comments. I think that's the best way to uh, communicate uh, the information here and to, get, uh, and to get a written response is to provide a, a, a written comments. Um, there's information in the plan uh, that will, will indicate how you would do that. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, share my screen um, and, uh, and get started here. So that, can I get a, uh, a, a showing of hands if you're seeing the, uh, the shared screen clearly that has a uh, public information plan with a, um, with a, a figure or an aerial photo on it? Looks good, Bob. Okay, good. I'm glad I've got some assistance on the, uh, the technology here. This is uh, the, the biggest challenge to this kind of thing is managing all this technology. Um, so as, as, as you all know, we're pre presenting a draft public involvement plan 
for the Southwood Hospital disposal site, uh, 111, 11 Dedham Street in Norfolk. Uh, and that's identified by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection with release tracking number 2-301694. Um, just as uh, by way of introduction, um, the developer and uh, <clears throat> responsible party, or in this case, the eligible person under um, SDEP terminology is 111 Tedham Street, Inc. Um, and they are represented tonight by Jacqueline Bart and Ryan Poitras. Phone numbers up here uh, if you need to reach either one of them. And we have established a, uh, an email account uh, for comments and communication relative to the site that I think will be uh, very useful so that any comments or questions, uh, communication need to have with either um, 111 Dedham Street or myself, uh, particularly for this site, will, will uh, not be buried in our barrage of other emails that we get. So a little bit about the site background. Um, the site's comprised of four parcels of land totaling about 90 acres. Um, three parcels are in Norfolk. Uh, one is in Walpole. It's just a, a little sliver of land uh, up on the Walpole-Norfolk border, and it just contains uh, basically a water tower is, is all that's on that parcel. Going back historically, uh, the property was originally developed as a hospital starting in 1912. Um, it was operated by the uh, federal and state governments for drug and alcohol treatment, post-World War I veteran rehab, and uh, cancer research and care until 1981. <clears throat> then from uh, 1981 to 1997, it was Southwood Community Hospital. And then finally, uh, it was operated by uh, the Archdiocese of Boston, under their Caritas uh, Southwood Hospital brand name from 97 to 2003. 2003, the uh, hospital was closed and it has been uh, unused and uh, abandoned since that time. Here's a locust map that shows uh, the location. Um, I think uh, it's interesting to note that um, this property is right down in the, in the southern corner of Norfolk, bordering Foxborough and, uh, and Walpole um, and across the street from uh, MCI. Of corrections. It's a little uh, bigger view of the property uh, that shows in the center uh, the main buildings. Uh, some of these are historic building footprints that I just tried to capture here so we can keep uh, track of stuff. Uh, so this is the main hospital building here in the entrance road off of Dedham Street. Uh, and this is the landfill uh, location area. So a little bit about the, uh, the Massachusetts DEP under the uh, Massachusetts Contingency Plan uh, Response Action History. There are three release tracking numbers associated with this property. Um, the initial one uh, we'll start with here is uh, 1694. Um, it was originally listed by Mass DEQE, which was the predecessor to Mass DEP in October of 88. Uh, numerous site investigations occurred over a number of years, and they identified what amounts to seven areas of concern they've, they've called out uh, in, in various documents. Um, four of those areas of concern are associated with petroleum uh, in soil and floating on the water table in the vicinity of the former uh, power uh, building um, where the boilers were located. There was historically underground storage tanks in that location. Um, there was a uh, heated pipe chase uh, that led steam lines in towards the building, and there uh, was releases of oil that occurred, uh, maybe numerous releases over time, some going back into the 60s from what I understand. Um, uh, AOC 3, so AOC 1 and 2 are associated with petroleum, um, as well as 4 and um, 7. AOC 3 is uh, related to sediment in an intermittent stream which um, runs along the, um, the eastern side of the property. Um, the, the power uh, building is right back here in the, uh, in the far eastern side of the property. The intermittent stream runs along here 
and then uh, it cuts across and uh, discharges into wetlands to the, uh, the south of the property. So the intermittent stream um, has, been, uh, has been impacted by uh, releases of uh, oil and other materials associated with the, uh, the historical uh, railroad siding and, uh, and uh, coal uh, offer that were located near the power building. <clears throat> Um, AOC-5 is a wastewater treatment filter beds, the uh, property had an on-site wastewater treatment system that incorporated a bunch of, number of filter beds and uh, treatment prior to discharge to the uh, wetland and surface water. And then uh, AOC-6 is the on-site landfill, uh, which is currently fenced to limit access. Um, apparently, the majority of the waste uh, generated at the hospital or uh, or a good portion of its life went into this landfill. So there's quite a bit of uh, variety as to what the contents are in there. Um, the class C2 response action outcome, which is, amounts to a, a temporary closure or temporary solution was filed in October of 2007. That basically says, said that uh, while response actions are, are technically feasible, they weren't feasible at the time due to uh, financial concerns and uh, the fact the building was still up and, uh, and, that, uh, and that there was no substantial hazard, which means no significant short-term risk to human health um, based on uh, current conditions at the time. This, uh, this figure shows the areas of concern just in a little more detail. Uh, again, one, two, four, and seven are located here surrounding the uh, engineering maintenance building and powerhouse. There were underground storage tanks located here. Uh, and the, uh, again, the, the steam pipe chase ran to the building in this direction. And because it was warm, uh, provided a, a pathway for um, number six fuel oil to flow. Um, C3 is a segment of the stream right here in the sediment in there. Uh, AOC5, the wastewater filter beds, and AOC6 is the former. Um, two other RTNs associated with uh, the site uh, historically related to um, the presence of floating oil in uh, monitoring wells in the site. Uh, in November of 1995, three tenths of a foot um, was found in uh, one monitoring well. Um, there was some excavation of impacted soil, pumping of visible oil from the water table in the excavation. A completion report submitted to MassDEP in February of 96, and that RTN was linked back to the original main RTN. So that, again, one main case number. Then in July of 2001, uh, half a foot of El Napoli of floating fuel oil was found in three monitoring wells located in the vicinity of uh, two former uh, 20,000 gallon number six oil tanks. That uh, I don't believe there was any excavation done there, uh, but they submitted a completion report documenting that it wasn't migrating uh, in June of 2002, and that RTN again was linked to the main, the main site RTN. So in 2015, uh, DEP audited the site, um, and there was a lot of administrative uh, deficiencies found at the time. Um, including a, the failure to submit a, a periodic review of a temporary solution, a post-temporary solution status report, a phase four remedy implementation plan, and a tier one C permit extension. So uh, all those uh, deficiencies were uh, remedied uh, by the end of 2015 uh, through the submittal of the required documents. Um, in order to submit the um, post-temporary solution status report and the, the periodic review, um, there was some uh, sampling conducted in 2015. Uh, the existing monitoring well network, which uh, was a total of 17 wells, uh, were, were gauged with an instrument to measure the depth to water or the, uh, the depth to um, the floating oil if it's present. Um, floating oil was found in six of the wells. Uh, six of the wells were dry. And, uh, and generally groundwater flow was in a northerly uh, direction uh, in the vicinity of the El Napoli, that floating oil located near the former powerhouse building. Four of the wells were sampled, um, groundwater samples were collected from four of the wells uh, in 
June of 2015. They were analyzed for the two, uh, using the two mass DEP uh, petroleum methods, the extractable petroleum hydrocarbon method for heavier hydrocarbons and the volatile petroleum hydrocarbon method for lighter petroleum hydrocarbons. Um, all of the light uh, hydrocarbons, um, the results were all below the applicable standards uh, for GW3, and uh, only one uh, of the heavy hydrocarbon aliphatic fraction uh, exceeded the GW3 standard. Um, all other um, EPH analytes were below the GW3 standard. The evaluation concluded that the plume of oil was stable uh, and had remained stable since the 2007 evaluation. This figure just shows uh, the location um, of the uh, different sample locations. And again, uh, if you look at uh, the data there, um, and particularly where the, the floating oil was, was measured, uh, it all is, is generally in this, this limited area here. So uh, now, now kind of turning to the, uh, the public involvement plan uh, process. Um, in order to address public concerns, there's um, the, the MCP kind of dovetails with addressing public concerns because it's a detailed phased approach uh, program. Um, in Massachusetts, it's been semi-privatized where LSPs um, kind of manage the, uh, the, the process and uh, are licensed by the state to do that and then submit documents. Uh, because this is a tier one site, um, DEP has uh, greater involvement and interest and uh, a greater attention uh, to, to submittals and, uh, and what's going on with the property. And, and I, I found that through uh, communications with uh, Rebecca Buswell of Mass DEP that uh, she has taken an interest in this and uh, is going to work with the, both the, uh, the, the property owner and uh, and the uh, PIP petitioners to, uh, to make sure that everybody uh, is informed and gets what they need. The phase approach um, basically goes through initial site investigation, comprehensive site assessment, um, evaluation, identification of remedial action alternatives, and then selection of those alternatives and ultimately implementation of the alternatives. Because they were unable to implement any cleanup action uh, due to uh, you know, the lack of a redevelopment plan or developer, uh, the previous owners filed a temporary solution. Basically, um, kind of puts you in limbo until you can uh, get to the point you can you can implement a, a permanent solution. So now there's a developer on board. Um, we're working uh, closely with the community, uh, the town of Norfolk, to uh, to develop. Um, a different, uh, remi or a different uh, development uh, strategies, different approaches. And ultimately, there'll be a, a consensus as to what works uh, for all parties involved. Um, but the point about the MCP process is that every one of these reports, every time anything's uh, submitted, um, it, 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 it uh, initiates a portion of, uh, of the PIP plan for uh, a public meeting, review of the document, comments, response to comments, so forth. So there, there's gonna be numerous opportunities as this uh, moves forward in the development remediation of the property for uh, the public to be involved and have comments in public meetings. Uh, you know, there'll be, there'll be uh, I think, ample opportunities to, uh, to express your concerns and, uh, and, and provide comments on the documents. Uh, ultimately, we wanna to get to a permanent solution. No significant risk to human health, safety, public welfare. Or um, that's the ultimate goal and requirement of the, uh, the regulations. Um, it may require a deed restriction, uh, and that is used to limit certain uh, human exposures um, if, if you're unable or it's uh, not feasible to uh, remediate all of the, the material to, uh, to a certain level or to background or to uh, meet. Uh, unrestricted conditions. So this is going to be driven primarily by the future use of the property, what the development scenario ends up being, and, uh, and what, uh, what works for everyone. Um, <clears throat> and, and as I mentioned, there'll be numerous public involvement opportunities um, as, as different documents are, are prepared and submitted to DEP. 
the public involvement activities really focus on, on two things that are spelled out in the, in the PIP plan. Um, one is to inform the public and then to solicit concern to the public. Um, informing the public, it, it occurs uh, like three primary ways, um, information repositories. So documents will be submitted to the Norfolk Public Library, the Walpole Public Library, and then to the Mass uh, DEP online web portal. Um, <clears throat> we can talk about the, how everybody feels about the public libraries and whether you think it's use of resources to, uh, to load the library up with paper or uh, whether everyone feels that the online portal would be adequate or some combination of the two. Um, the same thing goes for the site mailing list. Right now it's, uh, it's strictly a paper-based mailing list would like to be able to see it transition to something that's more email based uh, just because of the, um, the environmental footprint of, of printing and mailing and um, that kind of thing that um, it takes a lot of time resources that um, modern technology can facilitate. But I do understand not everybody has the email and so um, we, we can uh, discuss that I think as we go forward. And then uh, finally, the notification to local officials and residents of major milestones and events. And the plan details um, all the different things that might trigger that kind of notification. Um, the second primary piece is the solicitation of concerns of the public. Um, that's primarily done during the public comment period. So when a document's submitted after this meeting, the document, draft document is available on the MassDEP web portal. It will be provided to um, both uh, the public libraries um, to be available for viewing. Um, and uh, there's a period uh, of a minimum of 20 days to respond um, and provide comments uh, on that document. Um, there's then a period that, that, that we would generate responses to those comments. And uh, those responses would go uh, into the final uh, document um, and be submitted uh, to the, the DP web portal as well as the, uh, the Norfolk and the public libraries. Um, and then of course, public meetings like this, um, where there's an opportunity to provide comments and, uh, and ask questions. <clears throat> the schedule for public involvement activities um, for, for the PIP plan uh, tonight, we, we're having a draft of public involvement plan. The plan is available now publicly and we're having the meeting here tonight on June 9th. Um, We've uh, extended the, the public comment period a little bit to July 2nd, um, just for the sake of uh, convenience. Um, and, uh, and then the final PIP plan will be, uh, will be prepared and uploaded uh, by August 2nd, 2020. In general, the schedule for public involvement activities includes a public notice 14 days before the public meeting, uh, a public meeting the same day as submittal of a draft document and availability of that document at the repositories and, uh, and on, online at the web portal. Um, a public comment period of 20 days after the meeting and, uh, and report receipt. Um, a period of 60 days uh, for um, the, the responsible party to respond to the comments and then final submittal of the document within 30 days after uh, submitting the response to comments. The responsibility for implementing the PIP falls on the, uh, the property owner, uh, in this case, the responsible party or eligible person. Um, it's important to note that there is an appeal process through MassDEP. So if you feel that, um, that the concerns of the public are not being uh, recognized and uh, responded to um, you know, in accordance with the process, then uh, there is an appeal process that uh, can be used to resolve disputes and uh, you can contact MassDEP to, uh, to avail yourself of that process if you see fit. If the PIP needs to be revised, there's a process for that. Um, uh, it would basically be, uh, follow a plan similar to the others where the proposed changes would be placed in the, in the information repositories, notice of availability of proposed changes would be sent out to the uh, PIP mailing list. There's a 20-day public comment period and then uh, the revised PIP uh, would be placed uh, and made available for public consumption in the uh, information repositories as well. 
that's really a brief summary of, of what we're doing tonight. Um, the most important thing is, you know, we're here to, to talk about the PIP plan and get this in place. And then, you know, there'll be numerous opportunities for detailed technical discussions as we move into the assessment and remediation uh, phases leading to the permanent solution. So um, I think uh, if, if someone has a, a question they'd like to raise, if you can either uh, raise your hand, so say you want to do it, Jackie, they can raise their hand or they can chat and say you have a question. Yes, um, that would be best. And uh, before we dive into questions, I just want to flag in the chat here, Bob, um, some folks uh, looked on the DEP website. They couldn't find a link to our draft plan yet. Does it take a little time to process and, and get up there? Um, it might. Um, it was submitted uh, probably about 5.30, so I don't know how long it takes to get, but it should be available shortly. Okay, terrific. Um, so for the purposes of this meeting, I don't know if you think it makes sense to send around a PDF after the call, or um, maybe we could just wait until it posts online. Yeah, it should. It doesn't take too long, so it, it, it'll okay. be there shortly, yeah. Okay, terrific. So it looks like we have some hands up, so um, we can get started with questions. Um, it looks like Bonnie McLaughlin has a question. So I'm going to unmute you, Bonnie, so you can ask your question. Terrific, thank you. This is Bonnie McLaughlin. Um, in um, the neighborhood group uh, that's involved with the PIP in the research that we've um, been conducting, there have been a number of additional RTNs associated with with the 111 Dedham Street, other than the three that were mentioned in the presentation. Um, so were, were you aware that there were more than just these three that impacted that address? No, uh, what I've, the ones that I've uh, come across on the DEP website, that's all that I was aware of. So if, if you have um, additional RTNs, I'd certainly be uh, very appreciative if you could forward those to me. Um, and also, if anybody has uh, access or knows where additional documents might be located, um, you know, we're still trying to get our arms around this. It's, um, it, it's, it, it's a challenge. And uh, so, yes, if you have additional RTNs, I would love to, to know which, what they are. Absolutely. So, yeah, we, we can look to include that as part of our comments. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Bonnie. Uh, look like another hand is up, Mark Clarice. So I'm going to unmute you, Mark. Hi, hello. Hi, Mark. Um, what, are, what are your plans for protecting neighboring wells? Well, I think I can say at this point I have not seen any information that neighboring wells have been impacted. Um, and it, uh, certainly if, if someone is aware that there's a neighboring well that's been impacted, um, I, I would also love to know about that, but I, I've seen or no information that neighboring wells have been impacted. Well, I was, I, I was just thinking of when, when you go to remove all the uh, oil from the ground, is that gonna cause a problem with the water table? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, this is- okay. Well, it's not very soluble, and uh, so I, I I wouldn't think it would impact uh, you know neighboring wells. Um, if we have to excavate into the water table, there would be dewatering, which would control the water table locally. Uh huh. So uh, around 2007 or before, uh, 20 Everett Street, which is my next door neighbor, complained of gasoline fumes in their sump. And the town of Norfolk sent out to the DPW guys and then ended up having the fire department come out because the concern was if the sump pump turned on, it may uh, explode because of the fumes. Um, I haven't followed up with Marie Simpson at the fire department uh, to get records on that. But, I, you know, where did the gasoline come from? I know everything so far that's recorded is oil. But who knows? I mean, maybe maybe somebody dumped five gallons of gasoline next to the house. I don't know. I don't know the whole story. I didn't live here at the time. So, um, I can find that out from her. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And if you have any information 
we can forward and please include that in the comments. Um, again, in the, in the you know, 2015, the testing that was done in the vicinity of the powerhouse, um, there was no, uh, no exceedances of, of standards for the GW3 standard. Now, we'll have to go back and look. The standards have changed for drinking water. So I, I'll go back and look and see what, uh, what those, uh, those light petroleum or hydrocarbon um, numbers might look like. Um, but that's not something that I'm aware of that would, has been an issue. Um, yeah. But we'll look. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a few more hands here. Uh, I see Joseph Mulligan. I'm going to unmute you. Joseph Mulligan. Not sure if you're still there, but I think you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, I thought you would unmute yeah. me. Um, yes, I live in the adjoining uh, Walpole property. And um, what I was wondering is, are you going to be testing that stream that runs from the landfill all the way down and back of um, and back of where the water tower is and along the um, uh, along uh, Walpole into Winter Street? The stream that we're focused on, the one I'm aware of is surface water runs. Um, there's obviously a significant grade change between the water tower up there and the, and the hospital building. And it looks like the surface water runs to the south, it runs behind, uh, kind of along the railroad track uh, southward and then cuts across uh, the site. Um, and that's the, the stream that's been identified as being uh, you know, potentially having some contaminants in the sediments. So that's what we'd be focused on. Um, I, I'm not sure what stream you're speaking of. If you, um, if you have a figure or can, can mark up one of the figures that's in the, uh, in the plan um, and include that in your comments about uh, where it's located and, and your concerns, uh, we'll certainly take a look at that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same stream that runs past the land until it comes down to the foot of the hill that the, um, that the water tower's on. And so you would, you would be, that's further upstream then from where the, uh, the, the, the powerhouse was and the tanks and the other things. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Um, well, the, the water flows to the south, so I, it must be originating up there somewhere. Well, my concern is, is that it would be picking up uh, sediment from, I would think, runoff from that hill uh, where there was gasoline and extensive um, chemicals found in the soil and it all runs downhill into that stream. And then this, that stream goes down into the landfill. So I'm wondering to what extent are you planning on testing the stream and uh, what, would be, what would be the results of that? Well, it, yeah, this, the stream has been tested. Um, and so we we'll, uh, are going to review all, those, um, all of those documents, all the available information, and if there's data gaps, that would uh, that areas that haven't been explored, then then we'll explore them. Okay. All right. Um. Before I go to the next, uh, we have two other hands up, but I'm looking at the comment section now. Uh, someone observed. I noticed the absence of asbestos remediation in your presentation. Bob, can you speak to that? Yeah, the um, asbestos uh, is not, uh, it, particularly in a building, is not regulated under the, uh, the Massachusetts Contingency Plan. Um, that would be conducted um, as part of the building demolition um, and uh, attainment of a demolition plan uh, permit uh, through the town. Thanks, Bob. Um, next hand up is Walter Byron. Oh, hi, that... Uh... Asbestos question was mine, and I just wondered uh, how you were going to deal with it, whether it would be included as part of this plan or just uh, part of the demolition of the buildings. It sounds like you've answered it. It's going to be separate from this plan and dealt with during the demolition of the building. That's correct. That's correct. I can say that. Yeah, that's that's when that's when we deal with that's when we, we would debate the asbestos during the building demolition. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, Walter. Um, Vincent Smith has his hand up as well. I'm going to unmute you now, Vincent. Hey, thanks a lot. Hey, I just wanna echo uh, some of the concerns I've heard from my neighbors for uh, butters of the property on well water. 
So I'm wondering if you could kind of comment on the fact that there were, I think you said 17 wells that were originally there, but you only pulled samples from a small fraction of them. So do you have any plans to kind of uh, increase that range? Thank you. Well, just to go back, the, the reason there was uh, samples, water samples collected from only four of them in, in that there was uh, floating oil in, in half of them in, in six, and then six of them were dry and we couldn't get a water sample. Um, we will be evaluating the complete sampling network. Um, and uh, it, my uh, assumption is, my guess is that many of the wells are not going to be viable or will have been damaged over the years. So we will probably, um, supplement that network with new wells um, and look to address any data gaps, particularly making sure that we have looked at uh, groundwater, um, you know, between the areas we know that are impacted and the nearby private water supply wells. Okay, it looks like I'm just sorry, I'm just catching up on the chat here as well. Um, okay, what was the date of the last official testing and sampling that was done? That was in June of 2015. All right, I have another question regarding sam the sampling of the wells. Um, I don't know if this is answered already, but I'll read it. Uh, the radius of sampling wells also appears quite limited. Also, no wheel near the landfill. Thoughts? Well, typically, the oh, wells. Oh, well. Okay. Sorry. No well near the landfill. Yeah, I think. Um, uh, <clears throat> so there are some wells down near the landfill. Uh, they haven't been sampled recently. Um, right now, we're planning on, on um, some additional ins investigation and sampling wells um, sometime uh, between now and the end of the year. And, uh, and we'll, we'll look at the viability of all the wells that are out there um, and, uh, and what wells we think would be representative of to give us another snapshot as to what site conditions are and to ensure that we still have a, a condition of no substantial hazard, which is the criteria we have to maintain for uh, the temporary solution. Great, thank you, Bob. Um, two other hands uh, just went up. We have Andrew. I'm going to unmute you now. Oh, I don't know if that worked, Andrew. You you might have to. Yeah, 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 I got it. Thank you. So, hi, Bob. How are you? Hey, Andy. How are you doing? Good, um, Bob. I'm I'm going to just sort of. Uh, just let you know that a lot of people that are on this call here have a lot of institutional knowledge on this that you probably don't have any information on because the records don't exist. I mean, there is a person on here that does have, that wrote a book on this area that includes photographs that show buildings that no longer exist. Um, and as you and I spoke last summer about things at a very high level, um, th this, this has to be a neighborhood uh, effort to get you guys up to speed as quick as possible. Um, it's not something that um, you can learn overnight. Believe me, I, I've, I've read the data. I've read the reports too. Um, I was on the Conservation Commission just for Jacqueline's and, uh, and um, um, other, other folks' uh, benefit during some of these uh, events that occurred. So um, I've got firsthand knowledge of actually being on the site too, but there's, there's a lot of history here. So, um, you know, the comments that will come are going to be pretty, pretty strong, but it may be beneficial to possibly have a sit down, drag out, a um, couple Zoom calls or something like that, that just talk about um, all the things that are found there too. I'm, I'm offering this because there's a lot of stuff here, um, having institutional history of how prisons are put together. And this is the same era as the MCI Norfolk prison and they're, they're almost identical in terms of construction. And having worked there for 20 years, I, I know what's what you're going to find. There's, there's there's stuff on the ground that people still haven't found yet. So it's this is this is there's a lot of stuff that has to be looked at. So um, that being said, um, the other interesting thing about asbestos, um, there were buildings that were taken down in an area called the Oval, which is actually not included in the plan that you have up right now. Um, in the identical formation configuration was over at MCI Norfolk and those buildings were loaded with asbestos. Um, 
everything from tiles to siding to mastic to window caulking to roofing shingles and, and other things too. So um, those buildings just kind of disappeared off the Google Earth. If you look real close, they're actually sort of in the northwest corner, but it's something to look at. But um, you may find asbestos buried on site. So I'm just giving you a heads up on that too. So there's, there's definitely some stuff here that needs to be looked at, but definitely reach out to the neighbors. Um, I mean, the people that are here, just they'll, they'll, they'll give you as much information that you can handle. Yeah, and, and, and just to, uh, I, you know, I appreciate that, Andy, and, and I, you know, I recall our, our conversation last summer and, and you know, and, and you volunteering to, uh, to, to provide uh, information, and, and I haven't forgotten that. We're, we're not quite there yet, but um, anybody who uh, has information and they're willing to share it, please, please note that in the comments, uh, what you have, um, how we could go about obtaining it, uh, getting copies, et cetera, uh, and we'll certainly uh, take advantage of that. I, I think if we work cooperatively, do, you know, we'll undercover the things that are problematic here um, and, uh, and, and make sure that we get a comprehensive remedy. Okay, okay. thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Peter has a hand up. Just asked you to unmute as well. There you go. Yeah, hi. Uh, I just have some questions a little bit about understanding this process in terms of roles and relationships. Um, so, Bob, are you uh, paid for employed by DEP or GFI? Uh, GFI. Through, GFI, through, okay. Yeah, through 111 Denham Street LLC or Inc. Okay, um, so you're representing the developer in a sense. Um, the, uh, the question I have is, have you worked with GFI on other properties? Yes, I have. You have, okay. Are you able to share what, which other properties and projects you collaborated on? Well, I, it'd be a long list. We've done quite a bit of work with GFI over the years. Okay. Um, what about projects of this scope and size? Similar? Um, not, not necessarily, <clears throat> excuse me, with GFI, but with, with other developers who've done the projects similar to this, yes. Okay. And then in terms of work, in terms of your work and analysis, does it get peer reviewed by somebody independent, not employed by GFI? Well, I'm, I'm not employed by GFI. We're contracted by GFI. We're right. And a consulting firm. <clears throat> and, um, I, you know, we're going to go through a process uh, for every document. Uh, we'll be available for public comment. Um, DEP is following this closely. <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, and they have an audit process. Um, that's kind of how the peer review uh, occurs uh, in that regard. But there's people on uh, involved in this who are very knowledgeable and uh, I sure could provide very, uh, very significant and, and uh, capable peer review uh, just in the in the uh, the public involvement group here. The petition. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Joseph Mulligan has his hand up. I'm going to unmute him. Thank you, um, Mr. Bird. You said earlier that the development, the concurrent, there would be development and concurrent remediation. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that, you know, once the development process is fine and, and there's a plan and, and, you know, everybody's on board and permits are obtained, you know, obviously the building's going to be demolished. Um, that then, and, and all the buildings, uh, and that then exposes um, and, and makes it very uh, cost effective to go in and, and do any remediation. It's very difficult to do a remediation now of this size. Um, with a lot of buildings in place and, and, a, and a lot of concrete uh, involved. So um, it, it's, a, it's a, gonna be a, a synergistic process. Um, and that's really, um, you know, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, we, gotta, we have to have a plan and know what we're doing and what we're building and that'll drive um, what needs to be looked at more closely, will allow us better access and, uh, and, and give us a process <clears throat> to um, to get uh, the, the final uh, remediation complete. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. We have uh, two more questions in the chat. Uh, the first question is, at what phase will your process begin? Well, I, you know, maybe Brian can, can, can 
uh, answer this a little bit better, but I think once we get to the point that there are approved permits, um, we can begin uh, demolition um, and then, um, and then uh, the, the remediation aspects uh, will be likely conducted during that um, and, and, and thereafter and kind of in conjunction with the site work and uh, construction. You're muted, Brian. I think Brian's having some technical difficulties. Do you want to just come over here? We're in the same room, everyone. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Let me, uh... Now I just have to figure out how to get it off my headphones, uh, which I don't know how to do. Here, do you want to just take this and let's just throw this you out? You can use <laughs> Can everyone right, hear Brian? So it's a, very, it's a, lot, a lot of work for short answer. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to say is that, uh, just to answer that, I think I mean, really the process uh, has started already. I mean, we started, uh, I mean, we're starting, we're, we're going to be doing um, further investigations and sampling. This, this is an important part of the process. Um, evaluate, we'll, we'll be, there'll be a lot of things that we're doing while we're developing our, our long term plans. Yes, most of the heavy lifting happens you know, um, a little further down the road, but um, uh, this is the first step in the process and we will, we will work on the site and, and further investigating, understanding what's there. I mean, that, that's happening um, as we speak. So I mean, really has started now. I just, just, just you know, we're not sitting on our hands doing nothing. I just want to make that clear. Yeah. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so, all right. I'm we have two hands up here, Elizabeth, Whitney, I'm going to unmute you. Can ahead, you, Elizabeth. Yep. you, hello. Uh, half of the battle is for me, I know more about the Pondville site than I do technology on my computer. Um, good evening and thank you so much for coming here to give this presentation. We have been in great anticipation of it. Uh, my name is Betsy Whitney, and my family and I have lived in this area called Pondville for close to 40 years. I'm just giving you a little introduction. And our home is within walking distance of the former Pondville Cancer Hospital, now referred to as Southwood Hospital. As a self-educated historian of many years, I spent uh, many years researching the area called Pondville, and I spent four years studying, researching, writing, and self-publishing a book called The History of Pondville. And one of my favorite chapters uh, is entitled The Pondville Hospital. It describes in detail the very impressive history of Pondville cancer hospital established in 1927 at the request of the state of Massachusetts for the research of and the search for a cure of cancer in any and all forms and stages. Surgeries, treatments, medical and rehabilitative therapies were also goals of that fine hospital's programs follow-up and post-operative histories were carefully documented, and I've read many of the documents. The early East Norfolk Pondville Hospital became that state-mandated site, and the fight against cancer in Pondville formally began in 1927. According to my personal research, which included a book written by Pondville's Dr. Ernest M. Dayland, surgeon and chief of staff. The booklet is entitled Pondville Hospital 1927 to 1969, quite a span of time. <clears throat> and I have read many reports written by the Department of Environmental Quality, Engineering, from a historical point of view, 
get to the point. I became generally, in my readings, I became generally aware of radium. Oh boy. Radium was on the premises, stored, used, and possibly discarded on the premises as well. So previews of coming attractions. My question is, are you or will you be looking historically into what drugs and chemical procedures, including radium, were or may have been used at the Pondville Cancer Hospital during its history from 1927 to 2003 when Southwood closed its doors permanently? And to end my long question, and if so, uh, back then, waste, and of course, waste disposal is a huge area of concern in my book. Thank you. Well, I'd have to agree with you, and I think our big uh, concern and, and issue we have to tackle is the, uh, the former uh, waste disposal landfill. Um, I have heard anecdotal information about the use of um, radioactive materials, and that would be expected in that situation. Um, I, I look forward to, to speaking with you further, and, and hopefully you will provide some comments that provide uh, links and, and ways we can access these documents that you've written or that you referenced. Um, because I, I would certainly like to look into those in a, in a little bit more detail. Um, yeah, you know, I appreciate your comments, and uh, and that is something that will be on uh, on the list of of things that we'll be looking at. All right, um, Karen Riley has her hand up. I'm going to unmute her now. Karen. Hi, a button comes up when you do that and it was off screen, so I couldn't click on it. Hi, <laughs> thanks. Um, I'm actually one of the PIP members that has been helping to do a deep, deep dive um, on this um, site. And my question is, I know you mentioned that um, in all the reports that we've read as well, that yes, it has been marked as a post temporary solution um, you know, and there's a short-term risk, but the short-term risk has all been based on current conditions, meaning the property is not being used at all. So, um, number one, um, there have been previous um, developers that have come in um, and looked at this property and have pulled out um, based on probably a number of things, but one of which is the cost of cleaning up the site. And I'm just wondering from, you know, the point that you guys are at now, you know, have you come up with an estimate of what that cost is? And, you know, do you have a breaking point that you'd walk away from this property based on that? Brian, you, you want to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you had uh, sound, you, I guess you could. Um, I, I, I know I can speak for you know the conversations I've had anyway that that, that they are aware of of costs. There are some rough cost estimates. Uh, we've seen numbers put together by other parties, um, and uh, and uh, I, I think that was probably reflected in the purchase price that they got. Um, I, I can't speak to what you know decisions might be made in the future, but I you know, right now it's as far as I know, um, it, this is a very attractive property and uh, and. You know, they're moving forward with development. Thank you, Bob. And thank you, Karen, for your question. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few questions in the chat I uh, just want to get to. Uh, I'm going to start with Jane's question. Uh, the landfill is a very large area, almost as large as the main building. Is the plan to clean it up or is the plan to cap it and consider it no substantial hazard and put an AUL on the deed so it remains untouched? Well, that, that might be a little bit more um, detail than I can get into at this point, but I, I think um, the, the, the plan is to work with DEP 
and the solid waste folks and the waste site cleanup folks and uh, to reach a consensus on what appropriate closure for that landfill is under the regulations. Uh, and if it means it's capped in place uh, with a permanent cap and a monitoring probe restriction, then that would be one um, and, and probably the most likely alternative, but um, we, we would need to work with DEP on that. All right, um, next one. 111 Dedham Street Incorporated is listed as the owner of 111, 111 Dedham. 133 Dedham Street and an off-hill street lot is, oh, I'm sorry, is your research including all three properties? Yes, it, it includes actually four parcels, the three in Norfolk um, and the one in uh, Walpole uh, as shown on the, the site plan in the presentation. Thank you, Bob. Uh, next question. The conditions of the site when a final solution is reached seems to be a necessary piece of information when making plans for the site. Um, how do you expect approved permits to be given for a site in unknown conditions? I think the development process is different than the environmental process. Um, the, the, you know, the environmental process is handled through DEP, the development process and permits for construction and the occupancy are handled through the town. So, um, you know, I, I, we, I'm sure we'll have discussions back and forth, but um, they're not um, officially linked in some way. Thank you, Bob. Um, looks like this is the last question, uh, unless another one pops up uh, from Peter, uh, asking what are, the, what are the other alternatives to capping the landfill? A full removal seems like it should be on the table to enable better development alternatives and options. Thoughts? Uh, that is an alternative. I, as I understand it, that's an extremely expensive alternative. And on that same waste would have to go somewhere else. Um, and finding another location where that would accept that waste would be very difficult. It would probably have to go out of state, maybe even out of the country. Um, so, um, you know, and, and honestly, uh, I, I personally feel that you know, we shouldn't be taking our problems, which uh, we generate and, and shipping them to somewhere else. We should be managing them appropriately where they are uh, and making sure that, that we pr protect human health and the environment when, while we do that. All right, thank you, Bob. Uh, it looks like those are all the questions in the chat um, and I don't see any more hands up. So unless anyone has another question or any comments for now. Um, oh, here's another question. Um, two more questions just popped up. <laughs> I spoke too soon, everyone. I'm sorry. Um, from Tara. Uh, Tara Spellman is asking, most of the neighbor's water supply is private well. What are the impacts on the local water supply when slash if the landfill is distributed? Well, the, the landfill is, is not capped now, which is the worst case scenario. Um, there, there's just some soil sitting on top of it um, and a fence around it. So um, as that a, a formal landfill uh, capping program and design is, is completed and a monitoring program, um, it's only going to improve water conditions. And, and at this point, I'm not aware of any significant impacts to groundwater or to um, you know, local water supply wells. Um, but if somebody has information uh, to the contrary, or I, I, you know, I would, I would certainly like to hear that. All right, uh, Bonnie has two questions regarding the process. Um, the first question is, will there be a community hotline? And the second is, uh, what's the process for submitting comments? So Bob, I'll let you take that one. But no, I don't, I don't think there'll be a community hotline, but we do have a, a site focused uh, email account that we established a couple of weeks ago, and it's 111dedham at gmail.com. And that uh, email will be monitored by both uh, Jackie and myself. So we'll make sure that, um, you know, any emails, any questions, any comments don't get buried in our, in our mountain of other emails that we receive on a daily basis. Um, and uh, what was the second uh, question? Uh, what's the process for submitting comments? Um, you can submit comments in writing um, 
you know, in, in, in the draft plan, uh, my contact information is in there. You can submit comments by email to 111.dedham.gmail.com. Uh, you can submit comments uh, directly to me um, in my work email. Um, numerous ways to do it. Um, you can call me and, and, you know, or send me an email and let me know that you sent comments to make sure that I received them. Um, we're, we're pretty flexible. Uh, obviously, email is, is preferred just because it's uh, a little bit greener than, uh, than mailing things in the, through the mail, but, um, you know, it's your preference. Thanks, Bob. Uh, John Weddleton has a question. I'm going to unmute him. Go ahead, John. John, are you there? Not sure if he can unmute himself. Sorry, John, I don't, I'm trying to, <laughs> trying to unmute you. Um, it doesn't look like it's working, but um, if you can type it in the chat, that works too. Otherwise, um, I just put our email, that email address that um, Bob mentioned, it's in our chat here. It's 111, 111 dedum at gmail.com. Um, so again, feel free to submit any comments, additional information you'd like to provide, questions uh, to that email address. Um, and then Bob, I don't know if you, you want me to send the PDF of the draft plan along uh, in a file here. Uh, can you hear me helpful? now, Jacqueline? Oh yes, we can hear you. I finally figured it out. <laughs> I had a question. Okay. I had a couple of questions for Brian, if I could. Brian, have you started? Have you started soil testing for stormwater? No, I still can't hear you. Here, wait. How about now? Perfect. There you go. Oh, Brian, right. hi. This is John Whittleton. Have you oh, started I... soil testing yet for stormwater? Have not. You have not. Is your intention to mostly develop uh, the part of the site that is northly of the uh, landfill? Or are you going to look into the uh, bottom section of that plot too, as far as developing? I think when you get further south, you can see there's a fair amount of wetlands there. So. Um, we did have a public forum. We showed, you know, at least the areas where we think are developable. Um, they mostly be the yeah the, the where the existing hospital site is, and then a little further south. But it's mostly wet when you get way further south. So, so for, as a follow up, you have a lot of test wells down in that lower section of the site. Are you going to clean up any of those wells to test uh, positive for contaminants? Or are they just going to be all left B? Well, I don't know exact plan, but I like Bob to speak up. We we have to address any any contamination we find. Um, much sure information the question. Yeah. yeah, we'll we'll um we'll make sure that we have to meet um you know the the MCP risk based standards uh, for for all groundwater. Um, so at all locations on the property, we will uh, we will meet the risk based standards, uh, one way or another. We, we have no choice in that matter. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Karen has her hand up again. I just asked to unmute you. There you go. I actually don't have a question. I just, as I mentioned before, I am a member on the um, PIP, the PIP group, um, and a s small number of us meet weekly. And um, we are offering, if you're interested, um, you know, to attend one of our meetings. We actually started um, with Google Maps um, on the site and we've been kind of mapping out all of through going through all the DEP documents and kind of mapping out all the areas of concerns. So we would be happy to meet with you and, um, you know, just make sure that, you know, we're on the same page and all of that. Thank you. That's excellent. I, I appreciate your offer and, uh, and we'll certainly take you up on that. Um, one of the things I'd like to ask, and I think we have this now in the sign-in sheet, but I would have everybody's email address so we can expand our mailing list. Um, 
And if email is appropriate, um, that's great. But if, if, you, if you prefer to get things in writing, um, you'll have our email address. Just set, send in a request. If you want to be added to the mailing list, send in a request to 111dedham uh, at gmail.com and, uh, and indicate you'd like to be on the emailing, on the mailing list. Either just provide your email or um, provide your mailing address if you prefer to have hard copies of, of documents and, and communication. Thank you, Karen. Okay, uh, question from Joseph. Uh, he would like to know what part of the entire parcel will be cleaned up first. Do you know how the, or do you know the cleanup stages? Uh, at this point, I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, clearly the, the focus is gonna be on the, the oil area and the landfill. Um, but other things as we encounter them um, will be addressed uh, probably during construction. And we'll likely, as we've discussed, you know, between myself and Brian and others, uh, many times we'll likely encounter things there that we didn't know about. As Andy alluded to, there's a lot of history out there. So um, there may be a little more looking we need to do. And then, you know, once you put a shovel in the ground, um, you know, often there's surprises. So we'll be prepared to deal with those. Uh, we, this isn't our first rodeo and um, you know, uh, developing in, in New England in the, in the old areas is, um, is, is always full of surprises, but uh, we'll be prepared to manage them. Okay, uh, another question from Joseph. Do you intend to make a separate presentation to the select board and or sewer and water commissioners in Walpole? Do you also intend to share information with the towns of Foxborough and Rentham? Um, in, in really terms of, that yet. Yeah. yeah, in terms of sharing with Foxborough and Rentham, um, as far as we know, that there has been no interest from those those communities, no request. So we're right now we're focused on Norfolk and then Walpole because there are petitioners within Walpole, and uh, obviously we we have a parcel that's in Walpole. Um, in terms of the Water and Sewer Commission and, and others, I, I I'm sure that I can't speak for Brian, but I'm sure you're going to be talking to them. All right, uh, this one is from Sandy. Uh, are you still considering a warehouse? Brian, I'll let you answer that one. Yeah, I mean, we, we did have a, um, we heard uh, from the public that we um, some comments that that wasn't really uh, the preference. Right, right now we're, we're evaluating a few different things. I don't really, um, uh, we're looking at a bunch of different options. So uh, uh, I'm not really, I'm not really sure. Uh, what 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 is gonna what's gonna what's gonna win out? I also heard we also have heard from the town that you know that, that, that housing some component of housing is important and we've heard that loud and clear. Um, so we are we take it under under advisement and we are we're trying to figure out what's what's the best plan to come back to you with and show you um, as soon as we can. Okay. Not seeing any other questions. So anything else you'd like to add, Bob or Brian? Uh, just thank, thank you, you for everybody for participating. Uh, thank you for all being respectful and polite. And, um, and, and we look forward to working together. And, and I certainly appreciate all the offers of assistance and information. And uh, again, please note in your, uh, in your comments uh, what information you have that you can share. And uh, we'll... Um, We'll, uh, we'll go from there, beginning the long journey. All right. Thank you all so much. Again, um, just to echo Bob, we're really excited to be working with all of you. Uh, and we'll look forward to speaking soon. Please reach out um, with any questions or comments in the future. Thank you. All right. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. All right.